I'm here today with one of the world famous Tuskegee Airmen, which was the only black regiment in the United States Air Force. And can I get your name? My name is Sergeant Clarence Huntley. And how are you, Mr. Huntley? I'm fine, thank you. Good. Um, mind if I ask you a couple questions? Not at all. And how did the Tuskegee Airmen um, get started? Well, it, uh, it got started from Washington, D.C. That's where it got started. Oh. The Roosevelt uh, was a, it was the beginning of it. She was the president's uh, wife. And uh, I went to Tuskegee in 1942. And I graduated from high school in 42. I was 19 years old. And everything in Tuskegee was all volunteers. There was no draftees there. Mm -hmm. And uh, even, even until the end of the war. Yeah. Okay, and um, how many original surviving members are there still? Today? Well, I don't know. We have 118. At least we have here in the, for, the, for the Los Angeles chapter, approximately 10 original. And that was in the 100th Fighter Squadron. Okay, and uh, what inspired you to become an airman? Well, it, it was a challenge. Uh, everything was very, very interesting. Uh, the Pittsburgh Courier and the Chicago Defender was the one that was the front runners. That was the two largest black papers in the United States. And uh, so we, I just decided to go. There were five in my neighborhood and we all went together. All, all volunteered. Wow. And the last survivor of the five. Wow. And they all gone. And um, how were you able to cope with all the racism when you were there? Well, it was hard. You, you, you had two sides. You had their side and have our side. They didn't want to be, they wanted, to, we were always second class citizens. Everything was segregated. You had your own PX, your own theaters. Every place you went was all segregated. You couldn't, couldn't join together. See, just like it was at home. Okay, and when did you retire? I'm not retired. I'm still working. Oh, really? I'm still working. <laughs> I have to have something to do. I was going to retire in uh, 2001, but I lost my wife. So I said, after 55 years, so I said, I'm a, I had to have something to do, so I just keep on working. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. And also, were you ever engaged in actual combat? No, I was a crew chief. I crew chief of uh, the squadron commander. I took care of his airplane, Skipper's Darling. Oh. The, the original, uh, uh, the original airplane, and they're still flying. Uh, I can't think of Brad's uh, last name, but he's a member of our chapter, and he's a captain with Delta Airlines. And the airplane that he's flying is the original airplane that I crewed in World War II. Wow. And I understand that the Tuskegee Airmen are teaching under, under, I'm sorry, underprivileged people how to fly? Yes, they are. Right at the Compton Airport. And can I learn how to fly? Huh? Can I learn how to fly? I go out there and see. <laughs> As they say, you're never too old to do whatever you want to do. Um, not, not a bit of travel to failure. Okay. I'll see you out there. And how hard was it to keep patriotism for a country that, who did not treat you as an equal? Well, it was just like I said, it was a challenge. I had never been in the South. And at that particular time, people from the North, they sent to the South. People from the South, they sent to the North. So they have a bring you on both sides, teach you their side, and say. But it was hard because I grew up with multi-cultures mm -hmm. here in Los Angeles. So it was no surprise. You read things, you know, but unless you witness it, then that's a different story. Right. And was there a lot of support between the men working there? Oh, yes. It was a happy family, one family. Just like I stated, we were all volunteers. We had no complaints. Wow. And how intense was the training for the airmen to be considered to be the best pilots in the country? Well, I'm assuming it was the best. You had to be the best because they didn't think that you was qualified. You didn't have enough intelligence to, uh, to fly, see. Mm -hmm. But if you go back in a little of history, uh, this young lady, uh, Bessie Coleman, she couldn't fly here in the United States, so she went to Paris, France to learn to fly. 
And uh, she was 26 years old. And she was a very good, beautiful lady. And uh, came back and started bomb storming here. And then she got killed. And you said you're not retired. What do you do every day? I work, work at the airport. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, keeping yourself busy. Tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and do you have any children? I have two daughters. I have four grandchildren. I have uh, six, let me see, three. I got six great-grandchildren expecting another one shortly. Wow, great grand. Wow. Anybody yeah. interested in flying? No. Okay. No. And I don't know what else what I want to ask you. Um, do you know anyone from Buffalo, New York? No, I was I, looking at a list and I no, seen I don't a lot know of different names. From New York. Okay. And um, I'm trying to. But I'm going to say this before we close. Okay. I was fortunate to have served up under two black gentlemen from West Point. The first one you know was B. O. Davis, Jr. The second one was a young man by the name of Robert B. Trezville, Jr. And then graduate, he was, he was our first squadron commander for the one on the fighter squadron. And he graduated from West Point at 23. Wow. Very smart, very brilliant young man. He was a military family. His father was a bandmaster. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. It's good to hear. Yeah. Well, it's been my pleasure talking to you. Well, it's been nice talking to you. Thank you. And hope to see you all again soon. Oh, Somewhere. you will. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Hi, I'm here today with Colonel Louis D. Hill, and he is one of the world-famous Tuskegee Airmen, which was the only black regiment in the United States Air Force. And how are you today? I'm very fine, thank you. Thank you. And um, what years did you serve in the Air Force? From 1942 to 1971. I'm one of the few who stayed in. Wow, that's a long time. And what inspired you to become a Tuskegee Airman? Well, it was one of the things that was happening that uh, I felt that I could do something for this country. and. Uh, even though it wasn't the best in the world, it was the best I had been exposed to. I'm one of the few who volunteered and then did not apply to become a pilot because I wanted to help others become pilot. My father taught me that the most good for the largest number of people is what my aim should be. So I helped most of all of these guys come through as the officer in charge of cadet classification, psychological section at Tuskegee in 1943 and early 44. And all of these friends are still with me to this living and they proved that they were worth all of the effort that I put forth to get them through. Wow, that's good to hear. And have you ever engaged in actual combat? I am a veteran of the three wars. World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. Most of the time, I was leading in the headquarters, but I was a commander of a squadron in Vietnam, a matter of a squadron in Korea, and in the headquarters back in 15th Air Force after integration. Oh, that's good to hear. And um, also, how were you able to cope with and deal with all of the racism? I cope with it as if I was on the other side of the table. And I said, how would I like to have been treated if I was over there? And I was able to shame a lot of the bigots who had the misunderstanding of the availability and the ability of the Negro, as we were called then. Mm -hmm. And they recognized it early. Just to show you what happened, I actually went in as a buck private. So three months later, I was sent to officer candidate school, and three more months later, I was a second lieutenant. Wow. And then as we moved into Tuskegee and gave me this job as cadet classification psychological section. This is when I was making my mark, and I was continuing to do so, even when it was over 
when the war ended, I was the only original Tuskegee Airman in the Pacific when the Japanese surrendered. So I got invited back by the president to celebrate the 50th anniversary of VJ Day for a week in Hawaii because I was the original wow. Tuskegee Airman there when they surrendered. Wow. <laughs> and what do you, uh, when did you retire? Pardon? When did you retire? I retired uh, in 1971. After 30 years, I had been, I commanded a base in Philippines known as Bataan. Everybody heard about MacArthur and Bataan. Mm -hmm. Later in life, I was the commander of that base. Oh, wow. Uh, I retired in 71, and so uh, that's how long I have been retired. But I didn't stop. Mm -hmm. I still talk to the kids in the high school in every effort to let them know what you are to be you are now becoming. Right. The world does not stand still. So you can't say, I'm trying to find out where I'm going to be later on, because if you're doing nothing now, you're becoming nothing. Right. I get their attention with that type of thing, and they, they actually listen. And I'm pleased that some of them give up the recess. At the end of my discussion, they stay around just to ask me questions about, about the military. How did you get through there? And what made you want to join? Well, what inspired you? I felt that I, as a citizen, had a duty to do so, and that I could make a contribution. That that's, was the aim, the greatest good for the largest number. So I said, I can get in this and make a contribution. So that's why I wanted to become part of it. OK. And do you have any children? Grand huh? You have any children? I have a, a daughter, this lava. My second daughter was died in infancy. And uh, yes, the answer is that she's a retired herself now. Uh, I have people laughing at it. My baby is 65 years old. 65? <laughs> wow. She was one of the few gifted persons that uh, was classified after in a uh, test of the psychological setup to be in the top 3% of the nation's knowledgeable people. So wow. she got a uh, scholarship to Duquesne University and New York University. She attended these particular things. You're very proud of her. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's good to hear. Well, it's been a pleasure talking to you. It was an honor meeting you also. It's a very pleasure anytime. And I'm happy to give my opinion and help to further the cause. We were, we were saying we couldn't make it there with mm -hmm. Obama. I was pushing, and we did. We sure did. Thank you. Sure did. OK, thank you. All right. And could you sign my book, please? <laughs> Go all the way to the back and see if I have already signed. Nope, you didn't sign mine. I just bought mine. You just bought mm -hmm. yours. Okay. Thank you. All thank right. you so much. Hi, um, my name is Cheryl Major. Can I get your name? Uh, Ted Lamkin. And how are you today? Oh, I'm fine. How about yourself? I'm good. And I would like to know what inspired you to become a Tuskegee Airman? What inspired me to become a Tuskegee Airman? Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, it's not so much inspiration as it was. Uh, I was drafted. I was drafted into the uh, service in 1942. Okay. July 1st, 1942, and um, out at um, Fort MacArthur, San Pedro here in California, mm -hmm. and uh, was put on a train with four other guys, three other guys, and uh, sent to Tuskegee. And um, there I was in the 689th, 689th um, radar squadron. Uh, that um, was brand new at that time during the war, mm -hmm. and uh, they didn't know they knew nothing about radar, and the fact that uh, that uh, there was equipment that could uh, trace um, materials, planes, whatever else, without uh, anybody knowing it, uh, was not known, and so we were studying that. And uh, after I finished the uh, basic training, that's where I had my basic training. I applied for. Uh, Officer Candidate School, mm -hmm. and uh, was really 
pleased that I was accepted because that meant that if I could graduate out of it, I would be in the uh, Air Force. And I wanted to be uh, in the Air Force. I uh, was nearsighted, so I knew I could not be a pilot, but uh, that was as close as I could be, and so I was very, very pleased. And how many, how many years did you serve? Uh, five, uh, four and a half years in the, uh, on uh, active duty, and the remainder of the time I was in the uh, U.S. Air Force Reserves, and um, um, until July, no, January 10th, 1946. Wow, that's a long time. Mm -hmm. And how were you able to cope with all the racism? With racism, uh, racism was, uh, there, there are two sides to racism. Uh, at the Tuskegee, if you were on the base, you basically uh, did pretty good. Mm -hmm. And you didn't have to worry too much about racism, particularly after uh, uh, um, Davis at that time, he was a Captain Davis and a Major Davis, then a Lieutenant Colonel Davis uh, became commander because we basically were uh, an all black um, organization. And as a result, when we were in the, um, on the field, uh, we didn't have to worry about uh, uh, racism and this kind of thing. And uh, that was true. Uh, uh, throughout the service because we were always together and that's why the esprit de corps in, uh, in the organization is so strong and so high mm -hmm. and, uh, and there's lifelong type of uh, connections and uh, experiences which uh, uh, made and make uh, lifelong uh, uh, friendships. Uh, but uh, when you went off the base, then you had to be very, very careful that uh, you didn't uh, get sucked up into um, uh, uh, a racial uh, kind of problems. Mm -hmm. So you had to watch out and, and not, uh, not get caught up in them. Right. And that's just one way you have to, you have to, sometimes you have to hold your tongue or you have to uh, realize that you're in a very, very awkward position. and. And uh, unless you are willing to uh, sacrifice yourself, you, you're going to have to go along a little bit, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you figure that it's going to be better uh, if we demonstrate that, uh, that uh, we can take care of, uh, of uh, if we take care of what we're trying to do and, and we help win the war, that uh, we would be rewarded, you know. Do you have any inspiring words for the young kids today? Well, yes, I think um, as far as young kids are today, uh, education is uh, extremely important. I think that's one thing that uh, Tuskegee Airmen uh, really uh, kind of demonstrates in, on, in, in a, a very uh, uh, objective and uh, factual way because what uh, the United States did was trying to prove that uh, blacks were not um, uh, qualified and, uh, to uh, be uh, pilots and to uh, be in, um, in, uh, in, in the service and in combat situations. Uh, they got the most uh, educated, uh, highly educated uh, blacks that they could in the country and pulled them all together and put them in, in one place. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's one reason why I think that the um, uh, group did so well. Uh, also, they put it under um, a extremely uh, smart and, and uh, intelligent and uh, uh, the epitome of a military person and a leader and uh, he, in turn, um, uh, really kept the group together and kept people with uh, high uh, IQs and egos uh, together. And it uh, worked out very, very well. And I think was the key to our, our, success, our success was the education. And we hope that that will demonstrate to youngsters that uh, they need to uh, be educated and they need to work toward uh, 
uh, getting as much as they can, doing as well and as good as they can, because uh, you never know uh, the two things that happen. Uh, you never know what the future holds for you, but when it, you do meet your Tuskegee, you want to be prepared and uh, be able to uh, cope with the situation that, uh, that comes about. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you so much for taking okay. the time out right. to speak with okay. me. Good. And you have a great day. All right. Thank you for saying my book. Signing everybody else's. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just bought that book. Oh, you did? You got okay. it. Yep.